موج 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 is what brings us together today موج the blessed arrangement the dream within a dream and love true love True love will follow you forever. So treasure your love. This is Compass, if you don't know where you are. <laughs> We are having a wedding. Our first Compass wedding. Compass is a ministry for 30s, 40s, and a little bit beyond sometimes. And uh, we are a ministry of City of Grace Church, which is the big building over there. We also have a campus in Mesa, on University of Mesa Drive. We have a lot of activities coming up, which Carol mentioned in a minute. Um, if you have not had the chance, go to uh, Facebook or compassmovement.com, and you can get our weekly email list. You can find out what's going on. We are a ministry designed to uh, live out biblical truth that we learn every week from City of Grace Pastor Bobby Brewer. By the way, Bobby is a doctor, so you can call him Dr. Bobby Brewer. All right, hey, it's good to see you guys tonight. Welcome to the wedding. And so uh, first, we have a few uh, pieces of business first before we get there. One is, it is leap year. And so do you know what that means? Okay, so that means that the women can actually propose to a guy And the guy has to accept. So, I accept. All right. I, I accept. I am an ordained minister. All right. So uh, you can make all checks out to Robert K. Brewer. Uh, all proceeds go to uh, my charity of vacation fund. All right. Um, actually, right now, what we are going to do is uh, we're going to interview uh, some of the wives, some of the women. So I kind of uh, shared some things from my husband's perspective. So let me ask uh, uh, Lynn Van O. if she'll come up. Uh, Sarah, you'll come back up, and Lavelle, George, why don't you guys come on back up here, and uh, Jen, if you could join me with a microphone, please. So we're just going to ask these guys a few questions, then we'll get to our wedding. And I'm going to start with, uh, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'll let you hold this. I'm going to start with uh, Lynn, and I'd like for you to answer this question for us. So what was something that you learned about marriage just from simply doing it, something that you didn't learn in a class, not from premarital counseling, but just from School of Hard Knocks? Well, that it not, had nothing to do with the books that I read. Let yeah, I'll try that, Mike. Oh, okay. What I learned is that you following a manual doesn't work. Taking your favorite book and trying to apply everything it says doesn't work that you're, Sandy and John said it well, that you're two individuals that come from different backgrounds and uh, communication, communication, communication. And uh, as long as you keep your attitude right, um, that you're there, that you're there and committed. And that commitment is going to stand eternally. I'm going to use that word on purpose that there's no out and you're going to figure out how you can work together for the success of both of you. It's about both of you remaining who you are, but lifting each other up to become the best person that that person can be. Yeah. All right. Um, Lavelle, question for you. Uh, can you give an example of a time when you submitted, but you didn't want to? And, <laughs> and how did that turn out? Well, there's been more than one, that's for <laughs> sure. Um, I thought about this earlier, and I thought, I cannot think of one specific thing. But I know, I, I remember there was one particular thing that stood out to me, and I cannot remember the exact circumstances, but I just thought, okay, God, he's, he's the priest of the home, and I am going to follow what he says, and if I trust you, And I know he is praying, and he's doing the best he can to follow you. So then I have to follow him. And, um, and I was glad I did. 
I was glad I did, and I thought, I'm not going to make a big deal about this. I may not agree, but he's following you. He thinks this is what we should do. Then that's what we're going to do. Yeah. 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 Um, I'd like to encourage our guys that you won't be perfect. You, you are called to be the leader of the home, the spiritual leader. You'll mess up. And uh, what makes it easy for us women, if we have a wife who will support us you know, in this, even through our mistakes, you know, so that way we don't lose our confidence as the spiritual leader of the home. Uh, I want to share this with all of you. I'd like to hear from you. Do you mind sharing about a difficult season in your marriage and how you got through it? Uh, Lavelle, since you made eye contact. <laughs> uh, uh. Okay. Well, I, uh, for, for those who've heard our story, some of our story, you know that we've had to deal with a, a lot of stuff. And so I had to deal with betrayal and following that news of um, HIV. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. And the way I got through it, I don't want to sound like it. this is a cliche, but it was just God's grace. That's all I can tell you. And um, from the get-go, when he um, told me, when he confessed, when he apologized, when he said, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? I, right then, I knew I had to say yes. And um, it's because Christ forgave me. How could I withhold forgiveness when Christ had forgiven me? And... Um, that didn't mean that all of a sudden the feelings were wonderful. It was something I had to work through. And, um, but because I, I loved him, I wanted to forgive him. I knew it was the right thing, and I knew that God would give me the grace and the strength to forgive him, and that he would also then, he's, he's a God of restoration, and he can restore those things. And I, I believed that. And because I believed that, that's what got me through. Yeah. Here, here's the one I really want to hear. Um, here, here's the one I really want to hear. This year, I'll start with you on this one. Now, what's one piece, of advice, one piece of advice you give to men on how to be a loving husband? Um, for me, what stands out during those 15 years, um, my self-esteem was just really pretty much bottom um, because the person that I wanted to be the most beautiful to, the most um, desirable to, was a person who did not give me that, you know. It was, to get a compliment was, was really, they were far and few between. Um, so what I would say is, is make her feel like she's the most important person in your life. Um, you have a direct impact on the woman she is and the woman she becomes. Um, you can make her bloom or you can make her bury herself. And you don't realize the power that you have because everybody can be telling her all the things she wants to hear, but she wants to hear it from one person. And, and that's so important to be, for you to be that person. Very good. Lynn. Very interesting, I had the same thing for the first thing that I wrote down. We live in a, a world where affirmation is so fake, and it's just not there. And to hear the man that you've given your heart to say that you're the only one in the world and he loves you, and, and, and acts like it. That would be something I would add, if that it's not just words, but the behavior demonstrates it. When you make her feel like a queen, she'll act like a queen. She'll bring a royal blessing to your life and to the life of the household. Something that my husband did for me that I terribly miss, he always had time to listen to me. That sounds like a small thing, but the gift of listening to somebody is, is amazing. Uh, I, I'm the animated mouth in our family, I used to say, and he was the brains. And uh, I would come home from something and he would sit me down in a chair and he would sit next to me and I could go on and on and on. It didn't matter how long. If I had a problem, it was the same thing. He listened and he never made fun of me and he never made it seem like it was unimportant. And he would often be able to sort through my emotions and discover what was underneath there that I needed to pay attention to and could bring it to the surface so that I could look at it differently. Uh, that's something I, I think is uh, important. Encouraging one another, and I know we're talking about what we would say to men, but I think it's important for both to encourage one another to become what God has called them to. 
I see in young families today a lot of competition. Who's the smartest? Who the, does the most things? Who has the most certificates on the wall? Blah, blah, blah. Marriage isn't a competitive sport. It's an opportunity for two people to have someone who will stick with them 100% and call out the God, life, and gifts that are in them. I think the word uh, that came to my mind is kind of an old-fashioned word that you don't hear much anymore, but it was cherish. Um, if you cherish something, you're going to take care of it. You're going to protect it. You're not going to let any harm come to it. You're going to nurture it if that's what it needs, you know. Um, whatever it needs, if you're cherishing it, you're going to try to meet all its needs. You're, you're going to be there for it. You're going to pay attention to it. All those things. So I think that um, if you cherish each other in the true sense of the word, putting aside sometimes yourself, then I, I think that uh, I think that you'll have a, a lot more success in your relationships. Okay. Um, just two more questions for you um, from the three of you. If you could only tell a bride just one thing, a bride to be, if you could just tell her just one thing, one piece of advice, what would it be? Lynn, since you made eye contact. <laughs> I was looking at what I wrote down, and it wasn't this, but if I had my daughter sitting here with me, I would say, you know all this fussing you do to win his heart? Multiply it when you get married and don't ever quit. Okay. That's good. All right, what That's else? <laughs> um... I would say it's not what you think it's going to be. Meaning? <laughs> <laughs> Meaning you have to roll with the punches. And girls grow up with a certain, you know, fairy tale thing and life, you know, is happily ever after. And um, it doesn't turn out that way. It, it can be a lot better than you ever dreamed. It's just going to be different. I mean, I, you know, we've been, we've done a lot of things and been all over the world, and I'd never dreamed that we were going to do that. So um, it's not what you, it's not what you plan, and that's not what the most important thing is. It doesn't have to be like you planned. It can be better than what your plan is. Follow God, and He's got the plan, not you. And, and I would have to say, um, if, if there was only one word, it would be um, forgiving. Um, I know as a woman myself, I had to, to struggle and learn how to let go of things. Once you've, you've forgiven, you've discussed it, and it's done. It's done. Like Christ forgave us. He never brings it up again. That's the same way with your spouse. When you've settled it, don't ever bring it up. It's gone. It's done and you should never have to deal with it again. Um, it's hard to go forward when you keep looking in the rearview mirror. Um, but forgiveness, that really frees you to um, be a better person, to allow God to use you. Um, and I guess that would yeah. be my word. Okay, well, last question for the three of you. What's your greatest joy from being a wife? Well, mine is just loving him. I just, I really get joy out of that, taking care of him. Um, just the joy that comes, that he reciprocates. Um, it's just, it's such a team, and, and it's just, it's a joyful thing when, you're, when you forgive and when you, and when you um, just lift each other up. That's what you're there for, to make each other a better person than you would be by yourself. I have to think back. <laughs> um, Two really are better than one. It doubles the pleasure of life. It reduces the sorrow and grief that comes along in life. And it guarantees victory when you stand together. I can't, life without a partner isn't the richest life that you can have. It's just better together. Yeah, I would say, um I would say that the greatest joy is that feeling of there's always somebody there to listen to you, like you were saying, to share in your joys, to share in the heartaches. You've got someone there with you as a friend, as, you know, as more than a friend, you know, but I will tell you, the friend is more important than the lover when it comes through the hard stuff of life. Mm -hmm. okay. well, thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Really
So, uh, we've got a wedding to do. So, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to reverse engineer some things. Uh, what I found that happens is um, we do some things so often that they, uh, the purpose kind of falls through the cracks. Uh, the meaning, the, the true purpose, like why are we doing this? And this is what happens a lot of times even with weddings. Like, why are we doing this? Why did, why did they say that? Why is this a part of the, uh, the service? And so tonight we're actually going to reverse engineer spiritually. So normally, you know, obviously I'll take a, a text of the Bible and I'll start there. But tonight I'm going to do it just a little bit differently in that I'm going to take something uh, that you see at a Christian wedding all the time and explain the spiritual significance of it. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, get her done. All right? So I'm ready when you guys are. Her, her mystery groom has been revealed. <laughs> Always to AV people. Be sure to pay their AV people. <laughs> up front. So who gives this woman to be married? I do. And who are you? Um, <laughs> okay, so her mother and I. Okay, so what I'm going to do is do a pause here. Uh, yeah. We're going to kind of rush you to rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the very first wedding, Casey, okay, so you guys have been to weddings all the time, and this is exactly what happens. The bride comes down, and there's a verse here. It's so a Revelation 19.5. John, he says, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God as a bride prepared for her husband. And so this is where this tradition comes from. And so next time you go to a wedding, it, this is a reminder that the relationship between a husband and a wife is to reflect uh, the relationship of Jesus and the church. It's the service. It's like living illustration on the planet. By the way, the guests can be seated, please. Um, <laughs> This is where that tradition comes from. And when you ask, have you ever noticed that when you're at a wedding, normally the preacher does ask, who gives this woman to be married? This also comes straight out of the Bible. In the very first wedding, God presents the bride. Um, just, in fact, he says in Genesis 2, verse 22, it says, God brought her to the man. And so, Tony, today, tonight rather, God has brought her to you. Okay, uh, all those times that you've been a groomsman, all those times that you, you were the guy who were lighting the candles, well, tonight it's, it's your turn. It's your moment. And so God has actually presented you with a woman, right? After all these prayers, all the fastings, and so forth, it's here. It's your turn. And, and God says, you know, in Genesis 2.18, he says, the Lord God said, it's, watch this carefully, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So Maria, you have been specifically designed to help Tony be all that God wants him to be. And notice God didn't say it was bad. He didn't say it was a sin. He said it's not good. You'll be the man that God wants you to be through Maria being in your life. Now the turning point for me in my marriage was when I realized that God had given me Kristen to make me more like Jesus. Okay. Um, it says we need a helper. So Tony, that means, dude, we need some help. Right? And so we're, we're sort of being complete, actually, according to God. And in fact, it says the man. Right? So 
that's who she comes to. And so you've been designed, Maria, to complete him. So the, the, the light bulb for me was when I realized, oh, wow, God brought Kristen to me to make me even more like Christ. And there's two things that will really sanctify you in life. The church, I'm glad you're here on Wednesday nights. I uh, really encourage you to prioritize being here. I encourage you to go to church on Sunday. Get into a community of faith. I'll tell you why. The church will help sanctify you. You're going to bump into each other. You're going to need to ask for forgiveness. You're going to learn how to handle conflict. The church helps grow as you learn God's word being taught. It's going to grow you to be more like Jesus. And guess what else sanctifies you? Marriage. Okay. Each, each one of you, you're going to see blind spots that you've never seen before as a single person. You're going to see blind spots in each other that were never revealed to you by a roommate. Okay, but now, as the husband and wife relationship, the two become one, there will be things that you'll see in each other, and you need to share that because it's going to grow you to be even more like Christ. That's his plan. Now, Tony, we're told that you're to live with her in an understanding way since uh, 1 Peter 3, 7, to live with her in an understanding way. As guys, sometimes we're like rhinoceroses. Our, 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 we have a tough skin, and things that may not hurt your best man will hurt her, okay? She's more of like a butterfly. You can take a small pebble and throw it at a rhino, it'll just bounce off. You throw that pebble at a butterfly, it can do great damage to the wings and because they're delicate, it's how God's designed them. So you need to live with her, not as, well, this is how my roommate, he was able to roll with it. This isn't your roommate. This is your bride that God has specifically brought to you. And it says this, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, the, the verse here is leave and cleave. Uh, my favorite Hebrew translation here is that you are stuck with each other. And it, it emphasizes that you're to leave your parents here. It doesn't mean that you don't love them anymore. It doesn't mean that you don't honor them anymore. But this relationship from now on receives precedence over all other relationships. Um, she is now more important. She is now more important than your children. Okay, so for those of you that go into blended families, this is why many blended family marriages do not work out because the children get prioritized over the spouse. Okay, so now you have to leave and cleave. Still love them. Okay, they're more important than your dad, than your relationship with your best friends, your girlfriends. This relationship preempts all other relationships. And so um, now what I normally like to do here is uh, we, we continue with the service. And normally at this point, the, the preacher will share a short message, okay? Um, normally it's Psalm chapter 23, okay? So I'm not gonna read the Psalm, but I wanna share with you a, a few principles from it, okay? So the tradition here is for the pastor to give you what's called, it's called the pastoral charge or the pastoral exhortation, okay? The reason you are here is to be witnesses to this. This goes back to when Israel was at Mount Sinai with Moses, all right? Basically, a covenant is exchanged. And God says, I'll do these things. And Israel basically says, I do. Okay, so that's where that tradition comes from as well. There's an exchange of a covenant. So it's known as the pastoral charge. And so I'm just going to share with you some principles real quick from Psalm chapter 23. So we have a reception coming up. All right, so uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Here, actually, um, the Lord is not just a shepherd, but he's your shepherd. Okay, he is the one who will guide you. Okay, so now as a husband and a wife... The Lord's going to guide you through those tough decisions. Um, he's going to guide you through when you go through the valleys, when you go through the mountaintops. The Lord is going to be there for you. But he says it's actually Jehovah. Okay, so in English, it's, it would be in all caps if you look in your English version. It will be the Lord all caps. And so it's basically kind of it's like saying the Lord Jehovah, that's my shepherd. In the way some people have been saying, well, Tony, he, he's the one who cuts my hair. Or, well, Maria, she's my accountant. That's like giving like a personal address here. So David is saying, with the Lord, I know him by name. That's my shepherd. And so I want to encourage you to always seek the Lord out for counsel and for decisions in life. He will not let you down. Now, whenever you hear Psalm 23 in the future, I'm hoping that you'll remember this. Uh, secondly, God will only lead you to the right places. He says he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All right, so if you follow the Lord, even when it's really tough, Okay, there's going to be times where it's going to be tough to ask for forgiveness. There's going to be times when it's going to be tough to be the peacemaker. But the Lord will always guide you in paths of righteousness. For what? Well, for his name's sake. He didn't say it would be easy. But he said it's for his name's sake that God is glorified. Why? Because you are to reflect what? The relationship between God and the church. He has 
a place picked out for you. God has to prepare. It says he makes me lie down in green pastures. He's prepared a table before him in the presence of my enemies. I want to remind you, Tony, that God has prepared this night. He prepared Maria for you. Okay? No one else. She is the one. And likewise, Maria, I want to remind you that your husband has been picked out for you. He's been prepared. He's been designed specifically for you. All right? And so no one else can meet these needs. You will be able to meet each other's needs more deeply than anyone else, more so than a parent, more so than any past lover, anyone. Okay? This relationship is the one where you'll have those deepest of needs met. But God has specifically prepared you. Everything that you've been through okay, has prepared you for this moment in this specific relationship. Number four, I'm almost done, and we'll get through the vows. Um, valleys are included. All right? Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, but your rod and your staff will comfort me, is the word. Comfort. God will comfort you. So don't be shocked if you have hard times. What that, you know what it means when you have difficulties in your marriage? It means you're normal. Okay? All couples do. All right? So never question this date. Never question these vows that are about to be exchanged. God prepared you, but you won't go through some mountains, but the Lord will comfort you. And he knows the way to the next green pasture as well. Says he leads me to... To the green pastures. God knows where the tranquil waters are. So if you follow the Lord, he'll lead you back to the tranquil waters where there's peace, where there's serenity. He knows where the green grass grows. He'll lead you to the right fields that you should be in. And the last point I want to make here. So in the future, whenever you hear Psalm 23, I want you to remember tonight. I want you to remember your wedding, okay, your marriage. But the last thing I want to point out is that he's a pardoning shepherd. It says he restores my soul. In Psalm 23, verse 3, he's a pardoning shepherd. And so I want to encourage you to also be a pardoning leader. I want to encourage you to be a pardoning spouse. Uh, when, when, when your husband, when your wife asks for forgiveness, extend it. Okay, this is also going to be those times where you're going to want that mercy. Jesus even says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So that's my charge to you. So from now, whenever you hear Psalm 23, I hope you'll remember tonight, leap year. Okay, 2012. <laughs> and so now, um, Tony, if you'll, uh, I want you to go and get those flowers to your, one of your bridesmaids there. Yeah, I'll get you married, so I'll get you through this. All right, so, uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, Tony, if you guys can just kind of hold hands there. And uh, if you would, uh, be sure to look at each other, not me. You should be just jealous. <laughs> right, so, uh, right, I, 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 Tony, take you, Maria. Be my legally married wife. Be my legally married wife. To honor, respect, love, and cherish. To honor, respect, love, and cherish. For today, tomorrow, and forever. For today, tomorrow, and forever. It's a time out. Forever. All right. One of the things that changed my marriage as well for Kristen and I was that issues are going to come and go, but we're not. All right. Divorce is not an option here. Divorce is not on the table. Uh, I do not see eye to eye with you right now. Right? But we will get through this. Right? So it is forever. So when you say these vows, instead of just rushing through them in the future, when you're at a wedding, if you take these vows serious, there's a lot of power here right? in what's being said for day, tomorrow, and forever. So Tony, if you'll continue to repeat after me. And I do promise, and I do promise before God. Before God. Whoa, pause. Before God. I promise to God. And, if you repeat it for me, these witnesses. These witnesses. So originally, guys, your role is to hold this couple accountable to their vows. Okay? If they're going through a tough time, the, the, word, the D word comes, oh, no, 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 I was there at your wedding. Uh, I need to hold you accountable here to work this through. Okay? Are you with me? Do you see how, the, see how this has fallen through the cracks? So when you invite someone to your wedding, be intentional. Invite some people who really will. They're going to pray for you. They're going to support you no matter how tough it gets. So, I, okay, so repeat after me again. And I do promise before God these witnesses. And I do promise before God these witnesses. My undying loyalty. My undying loyalty. And pledge my faith to you alone. And pledge my faith and loyalty to you alone. Very good. So her alone. Okay. It's, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Stephanie. Just Adam and Eve. All right. All right. All right. Uh, to be there in sickness and in health. To be there in sickness and in health. Okay. To be there in sickness and health. One more time. To be there in sickness and in health. 
you know you're in love if you can really say this vow and mean it. What happens, God forbid, you come disabled? Are you, are you still in? If you can say this vow and mean it, guys, you know you're in true love, in sickness and in health. Okay. If you'll repeat after me, it's still to be your best friend. To be your best friend. Sharing together in happiness and in sorrow. To share with you in happiness and in sorrow. To always have compassion and love. To always have compassion and love. Without reservation or reward. Without reservation or reward. So I'm doing it because it's the right thing. Pause here again. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Without reservation or reward. Whether there's anything in this for me or not, I'm going to do the right thing. Okay. And the last one, that we be rich or poor. That we be rich or poor. Pause one more time here. We're in a recession. What if the going gets tough? Okay. Maria, are you still in? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Our premarital counseling was really rushed. So, uh, you're at, do we be rich or poor? Okay, so uh, regardless of the financial status, again, you see the power of these vows? Like, I'm in. Yep. No matter whether we make it or not, I'm, I'm committed to this. All right. Um, and so I, I pledge this to you. I pledge this to you. Before God. Before God. Today. Today. All right. And so now, Maria, if you'll repeat after me. Now, you'll have the satisfaction and joy of being Tony's helpmate. You, above all others, will have the ability to meet his deepest needs as his God-given helpmate. All right, so Maria, I need you to repeat after me. I, Maria, take you, Tony. I, Maria, take you, Tony. Okay, so Paul's, I want you to hear these, these vows a little differently now, based upon what you know. To be my legally married husband. To be my legally married husband. To honor. To honor. Respect. Respect. Love. Love. And cherish. And cherish. I'm going to pause real quick. Respect. Ladies, if a guy feels honored and respected, your marriage will be pretty safe. All right? Uh, normally, one of a, a guy's key needs is to be respected. Okay, if he gets that respect from you, you'll be in a pretty good shape. For tomorrow, for today, tomorrow, and forever. For today, tomorrow, and forever. I promise before God. I promise before God. Okay, so before who? God. Okay, God. And these witnesses. And these witnesses. Okay, my undying loyalty. My undying loyalty. To be your best friend. To be your best friend. Sharing together. Sharing together. In happiness and in sorrow. In happiness and in sorrow. I will always be there with you. To you, to you, this day, this day before, God, before God, and these witnesses, and these witnesses I pledge this vow to you. Okay, so stop right here. Paul's, normally at this point, you'll see a variety of things happen. Sometimes it's like uh, the sand ceremony where they're you know, celebrating blended families coming together. Sometimes there's like a unity candle lit. Sometimes couples here, they'll do <laughs> communion for the first time. And this is to help symbolize the fact that now the man of Tony is becoming the spiritual leader of the home. So this is why sometimes at a Christian wedding, you'll see them celebrating communion. All right. Um, so now I need to have the rings, please. If I could have the ring for the bride, please. Wow. Okay. Hey, let me encourage you, uh, when you guys get a best man, to uh, make sure it's someone who will fulfill their duties and really be a best man on that date, all right? So make your job easy, all right, in the future, all right? Okay, so Tate, you put that on our finger and repeat after me. Uh, all right, okay, so once again, if you'll put that on our finger and repeat after me. Okay, so normally you hear couples wax poetic about their love being unending, and you're like, oh, well, it's a circle, and it never ends. Okay, let me tell you what this ring really means. Okay, it means you're off the market. All right, you've been spoken for. All right, so. All right, all right, so. Now, there will be times these rings are also to remind you of this day. And so it serves as a reminder of one that, all right, all right. It serves as a reminder, one, that you've been spoken for, that you've made some vows before God and before some witnesses. And it also serves as a reminder to the rest of the world, okay, that some vows have been made, that you are no longer on the market. At times, it's going to remind you of what's been said. So, Tony, if you'll just repeat it for me, this ring I give you. This ring I give you. It's a token of our marriage vows. The token of our marriage vows. May it forever be a symbol. May it forever be a symbol. Of the vows we've exchanged. Of the vows we've exchanged. 
right, we're gonna go. Hey, now if I can have the ring for the groom, please. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, all right, Philip, place it on his finger. Yeah, we, we're in a recession. Okay. Right. And I'll say here, of course, obviously the same thing is repeated, okay, that you have seen. So I just want to encourage you in the future, um, when you're at a wedding and you see those rings that's changed, to remember, well, wow, that's actually pretty significant. And so what's happened is these traditions have fallen through the cracks of culture, and it's just something you do. And we don't know why we do it. Well, now you know why we do these things. So normally at this point, I would say, since you've made your vows and you've changed rings, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the authority of the state of Arizona. Okay, so now you're would be married. Okay, so sometimes people say, well, we're married in God's eyes. Uh, no, you're not. Uh, here, here's how you're married in God's eyes. You go down and get yourself a wedding certificate, mar or a marriage license, right? We get that thing signed, and so then you would be married in God's eyes. Then I would say I pronounce that you are husband and wife, right? Rather than man and wife, because we all know that you're already a man. All right, so, um, so Tony, you may kiss your bride. Uh, all right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, it, it is uh, my privilege to introduce for the first. No, actually, uh, this is your sex. Actually, it's, uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you for the second time, Mr. and Mrs. Anthony Bernardo. Okay, so um, now we're almost done here. Now what really happens now is the reception. That's where the party's at. That's where everyone really wants to be, is that reception. But also this comes from the Bible. It's in uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. It says, the angel said to me, write down blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. All right? And if you remember, the first miracle that Jesus does is where? Well, it's actually at a wedding. All right? See, God has a heart for marriage. And yeah, I know our culture doesn't place the same value on it. Our culture places more of a value on the wedding ceremony itself, but God places a value on the marriage. He wants that party to continue. They were known to go on for sometimes weeks at a time. Now, in case you didn't know, this thing kind of took on a life of its own, all right? So it was a mock wedding. They didn't really get married, all right? But I always wanted to do like a living, you know, well, you know, feel free to Facebook it if you want, but um, <laughs> what I wanted to do, I just, to put a life of its own, all right? So, uh, but I really want you guys, as we wrap up this series, uh, before you say I do, to know, hey, before I say, yeah, I get it. I I'm down with that. I'm in, all right? And uh, I think it'll have a whole lot more value for you in the future, as well as if you can really say these things, yeah, I feel very comfortable marrying you. And I think you would have a, a really peace in your spirit. If you can really say those vows and mean it, yeah, sickness and health, there were rich or poor. My undying loyalty, my undying love. Yeah. Okay. Remember those vows. May those rings serve as a reminder as well. Okay, so now normally we'd have a reception, but actually we have something that's going on. And we got two, uh, what's well, um, Michael Baker and Keith Curtis. This is their last Wednesday with us. So Keith and Michael, why don't you guys come on up real quick? And um, Jen, can I get a microphone real quick, please? And, uh, while that microphone's coming up, let me tell you what's happening next week. So I'm going to begin a series. I couldn't figure out a good name for it. Originally, I was going to call it God Behaving Badly, and that didn't go over too well. Uh, but what I, want to talk about, what I want to talk about is some of those really tough passages, mostly in the Old Testament. So that's what I'm going to do in March. So I want to encourage you to be here, bring your Bibles. In April, I'm going to do a series called The Evidence. Okay, uh, Evidence is going to be kind of something like an apologetic series on Jesus himself. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing for March and for April. So, uh, first of all, Keith, tell us why are you leaving us, where you're going, and what's up? I'm going to San Antonio. I got a job with USA. It was um, been kind of a long process. I it was just a good career move. I prayed about an opportunity to enter the insurance industry, and uh, it was just an unbelievable opportunity that I get to mentor them and they and um, and then learn from them as well. It was just uh, a godsend this position. It's definitely bittersweet, but it was just too good an opportunity to pass up. Okay, when are, when are you leaving? Uh, tomorrow morning. Wow, all right. Well, thanks for being with us tonight. So, we're going to pray. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, also known as Michael Jackson, for his yeah. work at the 80s. Uh, 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 
So Michael, exact same question of where are you going and why and when? And uh, I'm headed back to uh, Chicago. Uh, it's going to be next week because um, this to be more peace. Uh, I've been going back and forth for the past three, four years between here and Chicago. So this time I'll probably be gone for like six, seven, eight months. Uh, I need to go back and um, be at peace with helping my mother with some, some things, issues with uh, my grandmother and health. Um, and then also, uh, my sister will be moving out the, of a condo that we own, so I need to get it prepared to rent out as she goes to Costa Rica to teach for two years. So I need to go back help with family things, the condo, um, and just so I can be at peace that knowing that I've done my best to help with all my family issues. Sometimes it's good to be away, help from afar, but right. I need to get back. All right, well, both of you guys are just class acts yes. and uh, gentlemen. And <laughs> Both of you as well, I mean, you're like princes in the kingdom. And so we hate to lose you, but it's a great way to lose you. And uh, so we just want to simply pray over you and uh, bless you right now. So let me ask a few of our leaders, why don't you just come up real quick and just uh, lay our hands here on uh, Michael and also on Keith. And uh, we'll pray for them, and then we will have a reception out in the lobby. And so uh, we want to congratulate uh, our newlyweds. All right? And celebrate. Okay, let me just pray for these guys. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for Michael, Lord. Thank you for bringing him our way. Even though we had him for a short season, Lord, we're thankful for him, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for uh, him being a class act, Lord. Uh, thank you for how well he re represents uh, single men uh, to our valley. And uh, we're thankful for that, Lord. We pray you'll bless him in Chicago, Lord, and uh, bless him during his transition, Lord. Father, I pray you'll connect with a great community of faith. And uh, you'll use his gifts and talents there to make Chicago uh, a better place. Lord God, we thank you for Keith, Lord. Thank you for his uh, humor. Uh, we're going to miss him, and uh, Lord, we're, we're so thankful that you opened up a job for him, Lord. Uh, thank you that he's found a job that's in his profession, and Lord, we pray you'll just uh, bless him exceedingly. Let him be able to hit the ground running and uh, make a difference quickly. I pray you'll find the right church for him in San Antonio. And uh, again, we just want to say thank you for bringing these men our way. We bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, well, um, Happy leap year to you. Hopefully it'll be a leap year to remember. And so, uh, ladies, don't forget, hey, I am an ordained minister. All right? So, make all checks out to Robert K. Brewer. All proceeds help me go on vacation. And so, uh, hey, in all seriousness, thank you guys so much for being here and uh, for playing along, if you will. And I really do hope that may you forever see marriage as the way God sees marriage. All right? And may you go out when you get married. May you be salt and light to our city and to our culture. All right. God bless you guys. Have a great night. We've got reception. And we've got a uh, monkey's video clip for you.